ballot and vote um, in your town polling places. So um, I'm Lisa Floyd. I'm the chair of the White River Unified District. Um, and we will begin by doing introductions um, of the people here with us this evening. So if everyone um, would identify yourselves just so people know who they're talking to. We have that slide. So as I I'm said, Andre. I'm, What's up, Andre? Great. I'm Andrew Jones. I'm the vice chair from South Burlington. My name is um, Lisa McCrory. I'm the, the clerk and I am in Bethel and I have a I have one kid that's in the high school. He's in 11th grade and two kids that have graduated. One from the new Rudd and another one that graduated from Bethel before we merged. And I'm Chris Riley, uh, board member from Royalton and I've got two kids in the fourth grade. Rodney Raybill, Bethel, Vermont. Uh, I have one high school student, and this is probably my last meeting. As a, <laughs> uh, they'll have a new director taking my place tomorrow. Thank you. And then on the administration side, my name is Jamie Canardi. I'm the WRVSU superintendent of schools. I'm Tara Weatherell. I am the WRVSU business manager. Owen Bradley, middle school principal. I'm Reed McCracken, the high school principal. And I'm Andrew Bowen, I'm the elementary principal. Thank you all for those introductions. We'll begin our presentation with some housekeeping items. All right, so uh, you know, just a couple of housekeeping and budget uh, or housekeeping items and budget vote information. Uh, tonight is our second informational meeting. Uh, and then tomorrow, uh, voting will be done via Australian ballot uh, starting at 8 a.m. and ending at 7 p.m., uh, both at the Royalton campus uh, and at the Bethel campus are the two voting locations for, uh, you know, come to Royalton if you're a Royalton resident, uh, come to that campus and then go to the Bethel campus if you're a Bethel resident. Uh, if you have an absentee ballot and you haven't returned it yet, you need to do so by 7 p.m. tomorrow. And here's an example of what that ballot will look like. Uh, so whether you've received an absentee ballot or if you're voting in person tomorrow, you should uh, get a, a school uh, district ballot that looks like this. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so we wanted to kick off by talking a little bit about uh, the White River Valley Supervisor Union as an organization and some of the changes we've made this current um, school year. And as we move forward into the fiscal year of 21-22, to really just address some community concerns and trust um, across the 10 towns of WRVSU specific to the central office. One of the things um, that we've been focused on was addressing the deficits that we had across the supervisory union, both at the district level and at the supervisory union level. Um, there was an article in the Herald on Thursday, and I want to take the opportunity just to address one of the things they reported was over a $900,000 deficit with the White River Unified District. That was across the SU. Um, it was never projected that the White River Unified District was going to have a deficit at that, that amount. Certainly, the supervisory union was projected to have a deficit at that amount across all of our member districts and the supervisory union. The good news is, is that we've been able to uh, recoup some additional funds um, from our grants. We've been able to um, really have a focus this year on fiscal responsibility through the lens of appropriate and uh, proactive supports and interventions for students. Meaning that we're trying to get early intervention in place for our students 
so that we're not trying to fill academic needs and gaps, both socially, emotionally, and academically, through uh, more intensive supports and interventions. Meaning we're trying to keep our students here within the supervisory union, and we are hyper-focused on, as staff leave, what positions need to be filled, or how can we look to do business differently? And in the White River Unified District throughout this past fiscal year, we chose not to replace some of those positions. And in the budget that we're gonna to present to you tonight, you'll see a couple of positions uh, we decided not to fill um, based on folks that departed the organization. We have not had any of, of this take place and had it have an impact on programming, meaning we still offer foreign language, we're still offering music at the same levels that we were offering it. And we've been able to expand our alternative pathways programming and been able to have a schedule that's going to support more intensive intervention at our primary grades with the idea being that we're going to gap fill academics early because we know all the research shows that by the time students get to middle and high school that if students are still struggling with reading writing and mathematics that their trajectory is not great and so we need to make certain that we're doing a really strong job at the elementary levels to gap fill so that when students get to middle and high school, they can pursue whatever dreams they have in secondary and post-secondary pursuits. This budget does support that, and it supports it at a decreased bottom line for all of you, a decrease per pupil spending, and we believe that this budget will continue to support us paying down your deficit. And so I just wanted to make certain that I acknowledge that at the, st at the start, you won't hear me much more tonight, but do know that um, the administration and board has worked incredibly hard to bring you a fiscally responsible budget that didn't take away any programming for your children. And that I'm very proud of. In addition, we're focusing on investing in teachers and not programs. And what do I mean by that? We're having a, a clear focus across the supervisory union in professional development, in strategic professional development that ensures that our teachers have common language, common instructional approaches, and that they're research based. And so the budget as we move into next school year will have focused professional development at all levels of the organization. And it's part of why we're bringing in a chief academic officer next school year to help oversee that important work. We were able to do that because we were able to reduce the FTE in the supervisory union for next year by five full-time professionals. I think that's important to note. So we did bring in a chief academic office, but the supervisory union office is going to be operating on five less people than it was as we started July 1st. We've also created inter interdependence through our eight schools. I'm really proud to note that we open on September 8th in person across all of our member schools and our elementary students have been in school five days a week throughout the entire school year, other than a couple small shutdowns that we had to have due to COVID-19. And We've been able to do that because our principals have been working together collaboratively. I'm proud that our principals meet every Thursday uh, and they meet without central office in the room to think tank and problem solve and to make certain that we're learning from each other to do what's best for kids. So I'm very excited about the work that we're, is currently underway and the future of WRVSU in the White River Unified District. Thanks, Ray. So uh, every board meeting we report out on these are our goals that as two campuses and one school we're working towards. Um, so there's three of us that are the principals of this one school. Uh, I have the benefit of traveling between both campuses. But what we're working on as a team um, for everybody is to develop personalized and flexible pathways for student learning. And that looks very different um, as we report out uh, each month providing a robust and multi-tiered system of supports for students, which Mr. Canarni, Superintendent Canarni already touched upon. And while maybe it's been a little more difficult this year due to uh, the pandemic, we are working on uh, improving our community outreach and partnerships. So those are gonna be some longstanding goals that we'll be continuing to work on. And you'll hear probably a little bit more about throughout this presentation. And again, I'm Owen Bradley. I'm the White River Valley 
middle school principal. And one of the things that we do, like all schools, is have a continuous improvement plan. This is good practice. And we have organized this in our pre-K-12 setting. And we have several goals and goals at each of the school levels, elementary, middle, and high school, and some through line goals. So we are really proud of that. And it's what we, it's our touchstone. We go back to that and make sure that we're meeting those or working towards those goals at all times. One of the ways we set our goals and make decisions is by using and looking at data, uh, social emotional data about students as well as academic data. And this year we've been increasing our use of data across the elementary, middle, and high schools. Uh, one of the assessment tools we use is called STAR 360. Um, that's a test that we give in the fall and September, in January, and again in May, so three times a year. And we meet twice a month uh, as data teams uh, across the, the school and report out to the community at a board meeting every trimester. Uh, here are some of the, the highlights uh, from those data reports. So I think our biggest highlight we're most excited about is making it 95 days of in-person with our elementary students before we had to come out with COVID. So we're really excited about the um, the amount of learning in person we've been able to accomplish and the not that we've had not so much of a lack of uh, instruction. And while, you know, we would love to tell you everything's rainbows and roses, we have work to do. And part of that work we've seen is in our mathematics programming. And we are drilling down deep on that. And we're looking at vertical math. What that means is mathematics pre-K through 12. And we're really focusing on how do we increase the, um, the programming so that it meets all needs and at the same time, make sure students have strong skills as they move through the system. Generally speaking, across our programs in, in math and reading, one of the, the big concerns that the data show uh, year after year is that over the summer, there's a, a loss of uh, student learning. Uh, from the time students are out of the classroom. Um, with the extra 12 weeks that we were out of the classroom because of COVID last spring, that was a very real concern and, and something that many schools have seen around the state. Uh, I think because we've been back five days a week in person from the start in elementary and uh, four days a week in the middle school and high school, which is very unusual around Vermont, certainly around the country, uh, we haven't seen a decline. We've been able to hold our stores pretty, scores pretty steady. Uh, and there are a couple of bright spots, like at the high school, our 10th grade math scores are showing an improvement of 10% uh, year over year. I, uh, I'm happy to present this next slide, which is outdoor learning. And, you know, this has become kind of very trendy throughout the country. And we were there, and I'm really proud that we were, but we're also constantly improving that. And we're moving that up into the high school. And we have a pre-K program that's very robust outdoors. In middle school, we took advantage of that for safety and for learning this year. And we're gonna move that to the high school. There's so much, as we know, to learn outside. And in Vermont, it's really just a lovely way to extend your classroom and to engage students in learning. And we do everything from biology, arch, mathematics, and even fire safety and learning shelter building outdoors. So uh, some of the things to share with you, um, co-curricularly uh, and COVIDly, if you will, uh, when we had to close down last spring our spring sports seasons and things like the high school musical were canceled, uh, which was, was quite a hit for students. And we had to change the way graduation worked. Uh, but starting this fall, we were able to get in some of our usual co-curriculars, albeit in different forms. Um, so we had a modified fall soccer and cross country season where students wore masks 
and generally stayed physically distant. Uh, we had a short outdoor fall drama production that was videotaped and shared with the larger audience. Here you can see our actors posing in the school cart courtyard. Uh, we've started playing a shortened winter season. So we've now had uh, two uh, boys and girls varsity basketball games. Uh, the, the girls are playing right now on our new uh, donated uh, Pixelot video system, which is pretty impressive if you haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, and uh, our high school boys take on Northfield tonight at 7 after this meeting is over. Uh, so we're excited that they were able to get on the court and play a little bit. Uh, very different experience with nobody in the stands, uh, but uh, glad that it's able to happen. Uh, another highlight this year is that uh, some students started a high school newspaper club. Uh, and they've now put out two, uh, two editions of the Wildcat Insider, a school newsletter that's all digital. There's the next page, Ray. Uh, another big change because of COVID is uh, the way our community-based learning and flexible pathways have taken place this year. Um, usually we try to get, we get over two dozen students out into the community working in job sites, doing internships, doing community service projects, and generally getting real life experience uh, that earns them, them credit in the school. Uh, that hasn't been so much the case this year, although we have been able to have some internships uh, and encourage some students uh, to look at different schedules this year to really uh, facilitate their independent learning away from school and kind of set them on a pathway for success in their adult lives. Uh, some new experiences for our uh, flexible pathway community service, community-based learning students. Uh, they've done a lot of interviewing, kind of uh, meeting with businesses in the community and videotaping interviews and putting together videos of what they've learned and entered a couple contests with those, uh, which has led to a lot more and different uh, service learning experiences than we're usually used to. So I think we just wanted to wrap it up with saying thank you. Thank you for being here and your general support throughout this whole school year. Um, we feel really proud about this budget. We think it's responsible and um, we hope you support it as much as you've supported us so far this school year. And I get to tell you or say to you, thank you also for all of your support in safety when it comes to the pandemic. I know that it's been there's been major inconvenience in every possible way. And we have learned right in front of you how to do this thing called school in a pandemic, temperatures and gloves and hand sanitizing and on and on and on. And we it really we feel the support and we are very happy for that. Thank you. And finally, you know, we as principals, we went through every line of this budget and checked out every place where we thought there was um, anything that, that we could remove without significantly impacting uh, student experience, learning experiences. I uh, want you to know that we've, we've taken our uh, roles as stewards of your taxpayer dollars very seriously. So thank you. And I'll just add before the board takes over on the financial aspects of the budget, I wanna just thank our teachers, staffs, and students again. Um, because you're doing amazing work and I'm unbelievably appreciative as the board and administration are of all your efforts. Um, we couldn't be where we are without the efforts of our dedicated teachers, staffs, and students. So thank you all very, very much. Um, thank you all for sharing about um, what happens in our schools on a day-to-day -day basis. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, Andrew, Chris, and I are going to share a little bit about our budget, starting with our current financial situation. Um, so you may have heard in the news that we started with a general fund deficit um, from our FY20 audit of $350,000. Um, and so one of the things that we've been trying to do and that the administration and the staff and teachers have been trying to do um, led by Jane, Jamie Canarney in the school district in Tara, um, is to be really fiscally responsible right now 
um, in order to bring forward a surplus that we can apply to our deficit. So that's what's been happening, and we have been successful in um, reducing the deficit, or we, we hope we'll be successful. We're projecting a, a, about $170,000 surplus for FY21. Um, and that will reduce the general fund deficit to $195,000, um, 100, yes, and $344. So it'll be significantly reduced. One of the things from the original um, number, one of the things that we know is that we have three years to satisfy the deficit or to pay it off. Um, and so if we can move to the next slide, there's a little more information um, there. So what we'd like to do is continue to be as fiscally responsible as possible and apply any surpluses we have to that deficit. And then um, next year, actually decide whether what's left of the deficit will impact the tax rate. If it stayed the same at $195,000, um, then it would be three cents for one year, or we could ask for a bond to spread it over three years. Um, we are hopeful that we can continue to make that number smaller as we move forward, um, but that's sort of the worst case scenario in how we would have to directly deal with that. One of the things that has happened that's helped us in terms of understanding um, where our finances are at um, is that we've created a finance committee. So members of our board who are um, interested in the financial side of things more deeply um, and, and have a skill set that allows them to dig in a little more deeply, along with community members, work more closely with the business office. Um, and then they bring reports to our regular board meetings. Um, and that's been incredibly helpful, especially as we prepared um, this year's budget and thought about this deficit. So, um, that brings us to our next slides on our spending changes and priorities. So I'll turn things over to Chris. So for some spending changes uh, that, uh, that we were seeing, uh, as uh, Superintendent Canardi mentioned, uh, there are some positions that uh, we're not replacing. So there was a uh, one full-time position in music that wasn't replaced. Uh, we also, uh, David Wells left uh, at the end of last year, the uh, elementary school principal in Royalton, uh, and we didn't replace that position. Uh, and so that was another one full-time equivalent position that we uh, decreased. Uh, There's also three full-time equivalent support staff positions uh, that were decreased. Um, and then with reconfiguration of scheduling and roles and responsibilities, there's been efficiencies that have been found in driver's education, foreign language, and health. Uh, in terms of reinvestment, uh, you know, we are investing in pathway co uh, Pathways Coordinator, uh, also a coordinator of student services, and then again, e increases in outdoor and experiential learning. Uh, so again, net spending decrease though we're seeing is going from $12,098,119 down to $12,026,099. On the revenue side, you know, uh, so we have, you know, there's two sides to the budget. There's the expenses and then there's the revenues. So here are changes we're seeing on revenues, uh, for local revenues, uh, comparison of the the current school year 2021 to next year 21 2022 uh, we're projecting a decrease in interest income of twenty two thousand uh, dollars and then also a decrease in tuition of twenty eight thousand uh, dollars the next few categories we're expecting to stay level uh, but uh, act 60 transportation uh, money we're seeing that we're projecting that to go up by $2,567. Uh, but vocational transportation, we are projecting that to go down by $18,000. Uh, adult learning and driver's ed reimbursements, we expect to stay the same. Uh, but again, as the superintendent mentioned, uh, in terms of grants, uh, trying to deliver more grants uh, you know, from the SU and bring them to the school level, uh, we're projecting a increase of revenue from grants of $89,100. So overall local revenue, uh, we're projecting an increase of $22,900. Uh, 
But then when we factor in state funding, uh, we are projecting $74,000 decrease in educational spending, uh, and then also a $20,700 decrease in the tech center uh, money that we receive. So uh, overall, that brings us to, uh, in terms of revenue, a overall decrease of $72,000 that we're projecting. Um, so and you can see those changes in the sums of the two columns. For our equalized pupils, uh, we're also down uh, slightly, but in, the state is compensating for that uh, in their calculation for uh, enrollment uh, due to COVID. Uh, so for the coming year, if our enrollment, our ADM is down, uh, the state will use last year's ADM count instead of this year's. Uh, overall, our equalized pupils are down by 0.7%. All right, so I'm going to take over and do the fun part, which is how we calculate a tax rate from all those numbers. So um, just to do a quick review, the calculating a tax rate, you take your spending and you subtract out your revenue and divide that by your equalized pupils to get a per pupil spending. And then we convert that per pupil spending to an equalized rate by dividing it by the state yields factor, which we'll talk about in a bit. And um, then that's where the merger incentive comes off our equalized rate. The final rate is the equalized rate divided by the common level of appraisal. Now we'll go into each of those steps a little more detailed now. Um, so just to summarize what was in the other, other slides, the spending's down about $70,000 and revenues up, local revenues up um, a little more than 20,000. So the net spending is down about $100,000 or 0.8%. Our equalized pupils are down 0.7%. So when we um, divide those two, uh, the per pupil spendings, they basically cancel each other out. So the per pupil spending is down just 0.1%, but still a little decrease in per pupil spending is always a good thing. Particularly since you know, you're dealing with health insurance increases and other increases that you know, the administration worked hard to still provide a, a decreased budget, so. Um, so now to talk about the state yield, um, the state uses this factor to convert between a per people spending and an equalized tax rate. You can think of the yield as how much $1 worth of tax, how much per people spending one is worth $1 worth of tax. Um, the state has to estimate this value depending on how much they need to collect from property taxes. So they'll adjust it up or down to increase or decrease the amount of revenue they um, take in. But they can't know this, what amount they need to take in until they've all the budgets have been passed, but they need to provide guidance for us giving these presentations so that we can give an estimated tax rates to the voters before they vote. So what the normal process is, is in December, the um, agency of education sends out a letter that has an estimated yield um, that we use for our um, projections. This year, they came out um, with the letter and the yield was down fairly, uh, pretty significantly from 10,998 to uh, 10,763. Um, and so that would cause, with the yield going down, that would cause a, a increase in tax rate. Um, so, but that tax letter came out when there was still a lot of uncertainty about some of the other revenue sources that the state uses to fund education, which includes, you know, sales taxes and uh, the lottery and meals and meals taxes, meals and board taxes. Um, so there was a lot of uncertainty about that. There was, this was before um, the first uh, COVID relief or second COVID relief package had passed. Um, so there was still a lot of uncertainty. In January, the House Ways and Means Committee um, took another look at the revenue um, side of things and presented a bill, which is um, now in front of the House, um, which had a proposed yield of 11,385, which is significantly higher than the December projected yield and would be pretty good news for the tax rates. Um, so, 
you know, we are a little conflicted about what yield value to use. Usually we just use the projected yield, but since new information has kind of come out since then, um, we just wanted to make sure people were aware that this is fairly uncertain what the yield will be. Um, the final yield winds up getting passed by the legislature. And last year, you know, the proposed yield that was proposed by the House of Ways and Means Committee wound up being the final year, but the year before that, it wound up changing multiple times throughout the process before it became a final law. So, you know, right now it's proposed at 11,385, but that could definitely change. We don't want to overpromise and you know, say the tax rates are going to be lower than what they wind up being. So what we're using for our projections is the yield, last year's yield, which is kind of in between the December tax letter yield and the yield that's currently before the legislature. So we're going to be using the 10,998 yield for these slides. But just be aware that, um, you know, if you look at between the December yield and the one that's proposed in the House Ways and Means Committee, the resulting tax rate, there's almost a 10 second cent difference between those two values. So this could have a fairly significant impact on what the final tax rates wind up being. So, um, but using that um, last year's yield, our peer with our peer pupil, per pupil spending essentially flat um, and the same yield, the preliminary rate winds up being about the same down slightly. Um, the merger incentive, which we received for merging our two districts um, is slowly phasing out. It goes down two cents a year. And so that is two cents lower than it was last year, which makes our tax rate go up two cents. So our equalized tax rate is up 1.1% for this proposed budget. Now, to, the final thing to talk about is the common level of appraisal. And this was another factor that was um, pretty significant in impacting tax rates this year. The common level of appraisal is a way that the state adjusts the equalized um, tax rate to reflect um, the differing levels of appraisals in each town. You know, it wouldn't be fair for a town that has appraised values that are lower than property rates to be spending or sending less money to the state education fund than a town that had appraised values that were higher. So they look at how the a town's appraised values compare to actual sale prices in each town and come up with a factor that um, to convert the equalized rate to a final tax rate for each town. The common level of appraisal is independent for each town. So it's different for Bethel and it's different for Royalton. So despite our being one district, we have two separate CLAs because the appraisals are done separately for each town. So um, that's the main reason for that. Um, it fell almost 3% in Bethel, which um, caused the tax rate to go up um, about 4 cents there. And um, it fell almost 5% in Royalton, um, causing almost a 8 um, cent increase in Royalton. So this is a fairly significant impact on the final tax rates. And just to look at what it's been doing over time, it's been consistently falling each year. And as the CLA goes down, that causes taxes to go up. Um, so if you look just since FY16, it's been 22 cents of the increase in taxes have, can be attributed just to the CLA and 15 cents in Bethel. At some point, we'll do a reappraisal as a town and our CLA will go back up um, to reflect, reflect the higher appraised values. And you know, at that point our rate will go down, but presumably the values, home values that we'll be paying it on will be higher. So it kind of balances out in the end. So just to look at how um, each of these pieces impacts the final tax rate. Um, the net spending um, changes decrease the taxes a little bit, but that was canceled out by the equalized pupil change. Um, the incentive phase out adds two cents. The yield change, if it's the um, you know one that's currently in legislature, could lower our taxes by five cents, or if it's closer to the um, to the tax letter value, then it could add three cents. So that's a big. Um, 
source of uncertainty there, but hopefully it'll be lowering the tax rate in the end, but we don't know yet. Um, and then finally, the CLA added almost four cents in Royalton and seven, um, 7.3 cents in, in, sorry, 7.3 cents in Royalton and um, 3.8 cents in Bethel. So the final tax rate change in Bethel would be up 5.6 cents and up 9.2 cents in Royalton. You know, I know that this is an increase in both towns, but um, the we've been really um, happy with the amount of work the administration did to rein in costs and um, you know provide us with a bu uh, budget that cut spending and cut per pupil costs um, so that we could have a a fiscally responsible budget here. So um, to go over the ballot in a little bit more detail here, um, this is what you'll see when you go to vote or if you have your um, your absentee ballot. There's a, um, normally when we're in person, we go over each of these articles individually um, and vote on them separately, but now it's just a single ballot where each of these articles is a separate space. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next ballot, we'll fit each of the sections a little bit bigger so we can read them. Um, so the first three that will um, um, on the top left there are the um, district officers like the moderator um, and district clerk and district treasurer. Um, each of those just has one person running for it. So if you want to vote for that person, you fill in the circle next to them. And if not, you can write in somebody else you wanna see. Um, if you do write in, you need to fill in the circle next to the right end part. So article four is to fix the salaries and the amount of $600 per member of, for the school district officers for the 2021 and 2022 school year. Um, article five is to fix the salaries and the amount of $1,050 for the school district treasurer for the 2021-22 school year. And article six is um, I think we lost Andrew, Lisa. Yeah, I think so. Um, so he was just talking about Article 6, um, and Article 6 um, is just our tax anticipation note. So that's the note that we typically talk about that allows the school district to um, borrow money and pay bills until they collect all of the taxes that are owed. So sometimes the timing just doesn't work out um, and that allows us to pay our bills on time. Do you wanna take over article seven, Andrew? Uh, you can keep going, it's fine. Okay. All right, um, so Article 7 um, is the actual budget um, that we just presented the information on. Um, so that is the piece where the budget is approved and also um, it results in the education spending of $18,309.97 per equalized pupil. Um, article 8 and nine are for the Royalton um, School Board candidate. We don't have any candidates um, this year, so you would need to write one in. Um, so Article 8 has one for Royalton and then one for Bethel. And with us this evening, um, we have one person, Shannon Morrill Cornelius, who previously served on our board from Royalton but moved to Bethel, um, who is willing to be written in, and I'm hopeful she'll speak to you all a little bit more um, after we wrap up this presentation. Um, and then finally, we have the overview of the budget as a whole, not the budget, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm saying, of the sample ballot as a whole, um, again, in our presentation, just to show you a little bit, if you had, haven't already voted, because I know some people have, of what you'll see when you go to vote tomorrow. Um, 
at this time, if people have questions, we're happy to entertain those. Um, you can either use the raise hand function um, and I'll call on you, or if you have called in, you can push star six and unmute. Um, if you've called in, please identify yourself um, before you ask your question, just so we know who we're talking to. Thank you. Um, Shannon, would you like to ask Hi. a question or yes. tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, that wasn't why I was calling in. <laughs> I actually have a question. Um, Great. So I am particularly, you may know my husband's a, a nurse. I, I'm a geneticist. I'm particularly concerned about the cuts um, in health and health education, especially after this year, especially with, I, you know, Okay, my family's interested in health and I know the junk my kids have been sitting around eating. So I'm worried about the cuts in health education for our elementary students, especially. I think that we have to start them as young as possible. Could someone speak to that and why I know we're trying to, to do more with less, but why that program seems to have been singled out? Jamie? I'll start and then I think the principals can jump in. So Shannon, one of the approaches that we've been trying to implement across the elementary schools is around a wellness and social emotional curriculum that's implemented by all of our teachers. And so what we're looking to do is teach those concepts, but teach them across all classrooms. And so we've got a, a curriculum now that we've developed that's being taught by classroom teachers and Andrew could talk about who, what other members of the faculty are teaching that curriculum. But there are clearly identified lessons and in learning intentions weekly. Um, in addition to that, we've been uh, contacted by Sam Drazen who's been doing some really good work around social emotional learning that ties into health and wellness that we look to access and use next year as well that provides clear learning intentions and lessons that we could implement. I think the power of that then is, is that all teachers are using common language. So there's common language and expectations, expectations and routines around those concepts. And it's not just taught in health or and or wellness based on what school calls it. Some elementaries call it wellness, some elementary schools call it health. It's a one-off and it's not necessarily integrated and or reinforced throughout the school day. And so the hope is, is that those concepts are reinforced and integrated throughout the school day and not just in health class. Andrew, did you want to add anything more to that? <laughs> I don't know what you didn't say. <laughs> I feel like you covered it, but yeah, we we're doing um, mandatory morning meetings this year we started. So every classroom is doing a morning meeting um, and trying to incorporate a bunch of different pieces, um, some of the social emotional, but we're slowly building into that a bunch of this, you know, the health, the wellness, all of that. Um, so this was new this year, the whole morning meeting for everybody in the same way. Um, but that's definitely where we've been trying to incorporate those things and look forward to doing more of it. Did that answer your question, Shannon? Um, I guess also we, we currently have a health teacher. Has, has that health professional been consulted in any way? Because I know that a lot of the things she was doing were more innovative than just health. I know when my, I have one kiddo who's been through that in fourth and fifth and sixth grade. And some of the great things he learned were, you know, how to tell if an advertisement is fact or fiction and how to tell, which is so important, right? What are the alternative facts that we're learning here? And how do you write anything? So I'm curious, I, I just, I hate to see it lost. I think that there's a huge benefit to that and, and I hate to see that devoted time lost, but I understand if everyone's trying to teach it. Thank you. And Owen Bradley would like to respond as well. Thanks, Shannon. Great questions. And, you know, we get to this spot where it's like tough choices. We, I agree with you. The health program's robust and lovely. We actually have three people that teach health specifically content wise. We have uh, Lori Smith, Melissa Purdy, and Jim Hewitt. So at all three levels, the idea is to offer as much as we can 
and at the same time balance making sure that we're giving students strong literacy and mathematics skills. And I, I know you appreciate that as a uh, medical professional. Thank you, Owen. Um, we have other questions. Uh, Hi, this is Tammy Benoit. There is a question in the chat, and the question in the chat is, do we know if any state or federal stimulus money may assist towards our budget? Thank you, Tammy. I missed that. Yeah, thanks. And Tara, fill in the gaps for me where I miss it. But um, so one of the things that has just come down from the Agency of Education is um, that we need to put in place a recovery task force for COVID-19 and that money will be tied to ESSER II funds. And um, that's the elementary and secondary something uh, act. But I, I forgot exactly what ESSER stands for, but that's what it is. And so that was tied to money that was passed um, back earlier in the fall late fall that's not that doesn't have anything to do chris with the current um, bills that are, are happening in dc um, and so we fully expect um, significant money brought in via s or two that will be focused on truancy concerns focused on professional development for teachers focused on intervention um, specifically, how do we uh, deal with and address uh, regression over the summer and get students who have some, we still have some students who haven't been in school um, since March and one of the last March. And one of the things that we're finding is, is that outcomes for our students um, that are in our virtual learning academy, our teachers have been working incredibly hard in the virtual learning academy and doing a great job. There are very own teachers here across the SU, but the parents support at home specifically with our students in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade, and those primary grades are very dependent on the support they have at home. And so we've been working tirelessly to address virtual learning, but we also know we have some students that are gonna need a great deal of support because of regression. And so we've been meeting already to address how we're gonna do that in the summer. I think we're gonna be ready to launch a really strong summer program uh, that's partnered with One Planet. That's going to provide enri academic enrichment and intervention by licensed teachers throughout the summer, um, and we're going to target students and part of what we use to pay for it, so that money is not going to get in the way of students accessing that programming. That it will be open for all. Um, and so, those are some of the areas that the federal funds will be targeting. In addition to, we expect that some of this money can be used for infrastructure. And so we're hopeful that the timing is ripe for us to ad address our heating system within the Bethel campus, and that we'll be able to tap into some of these S or two funds in additional funds here in the future to offset that cost. And so that it's not going to impact the taxpayer um, because we do know that there's some delayed maintenance that we've had deferred maintenance that's occurred across the SU and part of that being in RUD and specifically the heating system in Bethel. And so we're gonna be looking to tap into those monies in that regard too. Tara, did I miss anything? No, you covered it all. And just to give the, the full title is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Shannon, you have another question. I do. Um, so one more quick question, um, or maybe not so quick, because it's now March and we've been here a year right, in COVID land. So I'm just wondering if someone can give a brief synopsis about what this whole mess has done to us financially. I mean, there were, you know, games that didn't happen and refs that weren't paid and field trips that weren't gone on, but I also imagine there were costs that were incurred that we can't even see because parents can't go into the buildings anymore. Um, so we have no idea what's going on except what our kids tell us. So um, could someone just speak to, was it net gain, net loss, overall crazy money going anywhere? So uh, Shannon, we've been able to maximize our COVID relief funds. That's part of the, the federal funds we've received. 
And any additional costs that were related to COVID, we build to that grant. We also have an ESSER one grant that we will use for the remaining months of the spring. And the projected surplus that we're indicating to you, both at the SU and at the district, that is with the expenses of COVID-19 and reimbursements projected and figured in. And so, yes, we have incurred costs, but um, I got to say that the feds have done a good job of supporting those costs um, and assisting us to stay open and have a fully staffed virtual learning academy. Without those funds, we would be in trouble financially, but those funds have offset those costs. So I'm just briefly, can you because we can't see as, as a community, we have no eyes into the building. Can you comment on what did cost more? So Are there programs been, that? Yeah, and I'll let the principals jump in. I mean, so one, we staffed our own fully staffed virtual learning academy, which has our teachers, uh, has one of the principals within the supervisory union, Lindy Stetson, who's been overseeing it. And so there were, there were some cost that we incurred based on needing to replace some teachers who are teaching in that uh, with subs, long-term subs. And so we've incurred some costs there. Um, in addition, we have brought in additional staff as floating subs because we knew we were gonna have teachers and faculty out due to the protocols and procedures of COVID-19 in health screenings. And so therefore, we needed to have additional bodies to ensure that we didn't have to close due to a shortage of staff, which I'm proud we haven't had to do yet across the SU. And of course there's PPE cost around, uh, around cleaning and materials and things like, you know, heated um, lunch servers to get warm meals out to students because we deliver meals to classrooms and students don't access the cafeteria. Um, you know, just, you know, PPE. So there's been significant costs incurred in those things. I don't know if the principals, you guys want to add any more. Certainly technology and devices was a big cost um, that we incurred and we were able to utilize our CRF funds to uh, allow for us to purchase the technology and devices we needed to best support our students. I think it's all kind oh. of, oh, I didn't raise my hand, sorry. I was just gonna say it's kind of been a wash. I mean, I've never signed so many purchase orders for a hand sanitizer in my life. And there's some funny things like that we've bought, like tents, who thought we'd ever buy tents. But yeah, we haven't gone on field trips and a lot of the, some of the things we do that are normal, we have saved a bunch of money on as well. I would also say that, you know, one of the things that's been um, amazing with the faculty is we froze the budget right away for not pandemic reasons because the, we didn't have a handle on it and Jamie wanted to get a handle. And the faculty's been amazing. We have spent money in other places like tents and shovels and outdoor stuff, sleds. And we also have not spent money as, as you might say. I don't know if we get to know what the wash is yet, probably later down the road. I'll also just add, we also through Efficiency Vermont have upgraded your guys' ventilation system to over a quarter of a million dollars. And so that's been money that we've used too to uh, refurbish um, our HVAC systems, which have improved efficiency around heat costs and things specifically at our South Royalton campus. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Perfect just checking the comments since I missed Chris's earlier. Um, Alicia, do you have a question for us? Hi. Yes, I do. Um, this is just more because I have sort of a new role um, being a property owner with um, tenants that have children that go to both schools. I'm just kind of wondering, um, I, it got me thinking about all of the rental properties in Bethel and Royalton areas and at $18,000 a pupil, how much, like if you have a family of four, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if there's ever anything in the budget that kind of, if there is anything that relates renting and things like that to like cost per pupil, like if there's people that actually are not property owners, you know what I'm saying? I don't even know what I'm asking. I just kind of made this like general observation about that, that like if you have a family 
that has a lot of children that is that's money that us that taxpayers which i guess being a property owner that's just a choice that we make but is there ever anything that kind of shows that in our budget lines to like show people that sometimes this is why it's raised and whatnot i saw andrew raise his hand so i'll let him take the first um opportunity to respond yeah i mean one of the challenges we have is actually with falling student numbers not so like when we have more students we're able to spread the spending that we have out over more students so our per pupil spending goes down um so when you have families with large numbers of kids that helps us because we're able to you know have more students to spread the spending out on um and yeah the the way that it works, it's just the property taxpayers are the ones that are paying into the education fund. So, you know, if you have a renter that has students, they're not paying for each of the students. They're paying rent to the landlord who then pays property taxes to the state. Um, so I don't know if that would be my explanation for those things. But it okay. wants to. And Alicia, I would just add every year, it seems like or every couple of years, the legislature takes up whether or not funding education um, spending primarily through property tax is the best means to do it and is there equity in it and so once again they've started to discuss it a little bit although my sense is due to COVID-19 and other things that they have to navigate right now it's not a priority but I do think in general something that Vermont will need to look at in the future is funding education via the property tax the most equitable way to do it and most sustainable way Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> we have other questions either about the budget or programming. So we're all here together. The ballot. Um, Shannon, would you like to share a little bit about your willingness um, to be written in on the Bethel spot for school board member, school director? Sorry, my husband is out back with a chainsaw, if you can hear that in the distance. They are working on a screech owl house right now, my seven-year-old and he, and they're trying to think, oh, Lord. Anyway. Sorry. <laughs> so um, my name is Shannon Moral Cornelius, and I did put it in the um, chat, just if you want to check how to spell it. I'm running for the Bethel seat specifically. Um, and um, I was on the board previously for two years and had to step off because um, when we first moved up here, we were renting in South Royalton when I joined the board and we had planned to stay and build a house there. And then we found the perfect house, but it was across the line in Bethel. So now we live here. And so now I'm running to get back on the board a little bit over a year later, um, but from the Bethel side. So if anyone has any questions, certainly feel free to find me on Facebook um, or, um, you know, let me know through chat if you want to call and chat later. Um, I'm happy to do that. But uh, so I'm running as a write-in candidate. So you'd have to know how to spell my name. And as I have told even my dear friends, <laughs> you can take your phone into the voting booth. So even my dear friends have uh, a, have a hard time spelling my entire name correctly. So um, I apologize for the <laughs> length of that. But uh, and we have two um, two kiddos in the school system, one who is a seventh grader and one who is a second grader. Um, and like I said, spent today building a screech owl house and now is out and they just hung it up. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Any other questions? in the chat. Just had a positive comment from Chris Maybe um, that the learning environment at the middle school has been a safe COVID learning experience. Um, and he 
all and they always welcome more outdoor learning. So I appreciate that comment. Or Owen and his team has made it a great experience. All right. Okay, I guess that's that we've reached the conclusion of this meeting. If no one has any additional questions, I'm just going to glance back at our agenda. Um, that brings us to the end of the meeting. You're looking for a motion, Lisa? Is that what you're looking for? Did we lose Lisa? Looks like we might have lost Lisa. I guess uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> this is Lisa, I will second. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. And I uh, hope to see everybody at the polls tomorrow who hasn't done absentee ballot already. Thank right. you. Good night, Good night everybody. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks for showing up.